good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank The Real Truth About Health uh, uh, for having me to this conference. This annual conference is a great gathering of a lot of different people with all types of specialties. Um, and, and I also want to thank those of you who on a Saturday morning have made the effort to actually tune in and, and listen to what I have to say this morning. Uh, there are a lot of people talking over this 10-day conference. This is Saturday. It's early in the morning for a lot. I see uh, from some of you who have signed in that we have people from as, as diverse as from Kansas City to France. So I'm welcoming people on a, a couple of continents here, and, uh, and I, I'm grateful for that. You are, by the very fact that you are attending this conference, people who are already interested in health, your own personal health, the decisions that you make. You are informed consumers. And what I've done as an investigative reporter for the past five years, together with my wife, Tricia, who's also a writer, is we've done a deep dive into the American pharmaceutical industry. We've sort of looked into the history of, of what made the drug industry that we know today, that industry. Where were the pitfalls along the way? How did it get here in this unwieldy, at times insidious um, industry that often seems to be working against the public good as opposed to for um, cures and health? And, and that's been a, a process. It was uh, during this period in trying to lay out this history. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning. Uh, you know, in the end, I have an 800 page book, 300 pages of it are, are source notes and footnotes. So I knew that the pharmaceutical industry would be coming after me and saying, by the way, how did you know that's right? What do you mean there's greed? What do you mean things are overpriced? What are you saying there about, about orphan drugs? So I wanted to make sure that I had original source notes for everything as I went through. And, and that's provided. But it's, it's a comprehensive history. Today, I'm going to give you some of the highlights from the early days to the current period, uh, and uh, the you know this is my high tech way of uh, talking. It's a series of little uh, note cards that I refer back to. So uh, when we finish that, and I won't talk for that long, uh, then we'll have a, quite a period of time for questions and answers. You may have things to ask, totally separate from what I've discussed, and I'm happy to answer them to the extent that I can. the uh, The idea for this book, by the way, actually came up in the 1990s. Uh, I was talking to another investigative reporter, a fellow called Jim Phelan. He had unmasked uh, the, the, the hoax that was at the time Clifford Irving's hoax autobiography of Howard Hughes. Some of you may recall that. And we were talking about investigative journalism in general. And I asked him, he, uh, he was then in his 80s, uh, you know, what would you do if you were doing another book? And he said, I would do one about the drug industry, no question about it. It's like throwing a dart at a board. You're going to hit a good story. There's so much to tell. That sat in the back of my mind. And a lot of books came up along the way, as you heard. Finally got a chance to turn to this full time. After I finished a book in 2015 on the history of the finances of the Vatican, uh, able to turn to this. And this has been sort of the project for the past five years. It was published on March 10th of 2020, the day before the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a pandemic. And although the second to last chapter in this book is called The Coming Pandemic, COVID is not mentioned in the book. It wasn't then out at the time that I had finished it. But um, I talk about uh, coming pandemics and what drug companies hope to be able to, uh, how they deal with them and how they are profit streams for them in the future. So I'm very proud of this book, by the way, as a sidelight. Not only did you hear Ben say before from the New York Times that it reads like an encyclopedic indictment of the pharmaceutical industry, a pharmaceutical version of cops and robbers, but other reviews from Pittsburgh Post Gazette to to the Washington Standard talk about this as an encyclopedic, and compelling and enraging expose of the drug industry. Uh, just a week ago, uh, the Florida Book Awards, which gives awards to Florida-based authors, I'm based in in South Florida, gave it the best general nonfiction book uh, award of 2020. And the Society of American Journalists and Editors uh, named, uh, shortlisted it for the best business book of 2020. Uh, I wasn't sure how it would be received because it is an in-depth, I try to be balanced in this take on the drug industry by covering the things that have been good that have come out of labs at times. Uh, and we can talk about some of those uh, versus the greed in the boardroom and in marketing. But it seems that the 
the things that they do that are nefarious to the ones we often remember because there are so many of them. For those of you, some of you may be familiar with it and others may not, but the origins of the American drug industry actually go back to addictive drugs um, in the middle of the 1800s uh, at a time when there were no rules. It's the wild west of drugs. Uh, you know, I live in uh, Miami and here you'll often hear people say, uh, the cocaine cowboy days, the craziest days of uh, the drug dealers in South Florida. Um, I call the the period up through the mid 1800s into the early 1900s, the cocaine cowboy days of the drug industry because they were literally often cocaine. Everything went cannabis, cocaine, heroin, morphine, opium, uh, you name it. You could put it together into any remedy you wanted. They were marketed as so-called patent drugs, cure-alls, snake oil salesmen. Uh, the, you didn't have to prove that anything was safe. You didn't have to prove that anything was effective. You didn't even have to list what was on the label. Uh, and things were sold that became quite famous over a period of time. Uh, a One of the most popular drugs of the time, something called the king of baby smoothers, was the, that company was very clever. They looked through newspapers to see uh, birth announcements. Then they would send a free copy of what they called the, the great baby smoother. It would, it would make sure that your baby slept through the night and didn't bother anyone. Turns out that that was about a third pure opium. Uh, after a while, when a number of babies started to die, there was an outcry in the market. It was taken off the market voluntarily by the people that had put it on and already made a million dollars. The, the Sears and Roebuck, was the catalog that I guess was the Amazon of its day. For $1.50, you could go ahead and order a vial of pure cocaine and a syringe. So that's the world that the American drug industry first comes into. And what it comes into at that time, by the way, is a boom for morphine and painkillers caused as a result of the Civil War. There's this tremendous demand. And so a couple of German cousins in Brooklyn Charles Pfizer and his cousin decide, hey, that looks like a pretty good business. They open up a, a factory in Brooklyn. They start to manufacture morphine with $2,500 in their own savings. Two pharmacist brothers in Philadelphia, John and Frank Wyeth, think, yeah, it looks like a pretty good industry. And they get into it as well. A naval wartime surgeon who saw firsthand that the morphine that arrived at the front lines was often adulterated and wasn't of good quality, thought he could manufacture better quality morphine Edward Robinson Squibb was his name. Um, a, a Union Army colonel thought the same thing. His name was Eli Lilly. Uh, Harvey Park and George Davis, one was an investor and one was a 27-year-old salesman. They formed Park Davis uh, at the same time. And Burroughs Welcome comes from, from two fellows, Silas Burroughs and Henry Welcome, who decide that the American pharmaceutical business is so crowded by that time with all these newcomers, they're actually moving over to London, which they do. This is a period, by the way, when there are not just the name brands that we think of as the American companies that form, you hear those names, but the German companies that already existed. And one of the biggest was Bayer. Bayer had existed for hundreds of years, starting as a small chemical company and then had started to produce cures. They had a research lab. So Bayer comes up with, inside their labs, four different categories of drugs over a five-year period drugs that will change the industry in some ways. Remember, at this time, you need no prescription. You're over the age of 18, you can go into any store that sells any of these remedies and be able to buy them. Here's what Bayer does. Starting, excuse me, in 1897, inside their lab, they discover acetaminophen, which we know as Tylenol, paracetamol, for those of you often in, in the EU uh, and in the UK. So in 1898, the very same team discovers aspirin, a wonder drug, a remarkable, and they market it as, uh, under that trade name as aspirin. Um, the, as a matter of fact, named after uh, the, the head of that particular team was a devout Catholic and named it after a Saint Aspirin of Avila, which was the a saint who uh, was supposed to help cure headaches. In 1900, just a couple of years later, Bayer comes up with a, a new product called heroin. They actually trademark the name heroin after the German name Harosh for heroic. And they market heroin not only as good for children to soothe coughs and quiet children, but as a cure for morphine addiction because morphine was what nobody had a patent on was becoming an addictive problem. So they said, oh, heroin will get you off of morphine. Well, it will to some extent, but with not very good side uh, results because it's a new type of addiction. 
And, and three years later, in 1903, they finished this cycle of drug discovery. They, Bayer discovers the entire class of barbiturates. Uh, their particular brand is phenobarbital, but they develop barbiturates as a class. So now think of this. They have four major drug discoveries. They have barbiturates, heroin, aspirin, and acetaminophen. And guess which one Bayer decided not to put to the market because inside their lab, they had determined it was too dangerous. Acetaminophen, Tylenol. Hard to imagine, but true. Tylenol they thought was too dangerous, but they put heroin up, they put barbiturates up. No, no prescription required. You could go in and you could buy them at any time and aspirin as well. The, all of these free drugs led to a pushback. And there was an effort, uh, especially with a fellow called Harvey Washington Wiley. He's a great story and I have a chapter about him. He's the son of an itinerant revivalist Christian preacher. He comes from a very uh, sort of simple background, born into a log cabin. And he comes to Washington in this wide eyed idealism and they make him the head of the, the, the Bureau of Chemistry. They make him the head of the Bureau of Chemistry because he's talking about dealing with additives and preservatives added in food because there are no rules regulating in them. He's convinced that a lot of them like formaldehyde to keep beef and other types of mercury items to keep fish would be dangerous. So they said, okay, run the Bureau of Chemistry because nobody cared about the Bureau of Chemistry. It wasn't very important. It literally just had a handful of workers in it. So what he does is he becomes sort of the, the protagonist for, I want a federal rule about food and safety. And those food and safety rules really also then overlap into drug rules. So he leads the effort. He gets rebuffed by Congress for a number of times. He creates a thing. I have a chapter called the, you know, the Poison Squad. Poison Squad is an amazing, it's the first, I guess, in some ways it's the first real life uh, reality show, uh, although it wasn't on television, there was no TV, but it was covered wildly in the press and became a famous thing. He had a dozen volunteers. They would dress up in formal wear every evening um, and he would feed them an assortment of food that he had made in a kitchen in the, in the basement of the Bureau of Chemistry. And then he would add, add, add different additives and preservatives to it and not tell them what was in it and see which one of those volunteers got sick over time, which one developed health problems. It was his live ongoing study. Eventually when one died, that study was stopped. But I will tell you, it was an experiment that helped him eventually get a law together that passed Congress in 1906 called the Pure Food and Drugs Act. And what pushed it over, it's the first federal regulation about drugs in America and, and about food. What pushed it over the top is you have Harvey Washington and Wiley leading this crusade. And then you have by coincidence, Upton Sinclair, one of the great muckrakers of his time, puts out a book called The Jungle. And although it was a novel, there are 15 stomach wrenching pages in it about the meatpacking industry in Chicago. And it led to an outrage in Congress. So it forced them to finally pass this legislation. Now, what was the, the Pure Food and Drug Act was just about truth and labeling, which is really interesting because it didn't have anything to do with safety. It didn't have anything to do with the idea of whether the drugs that were being marketed were effective or not. And it didn't stop any of the drugs like heroin that were already on the market. All it said, was that if you put heroin, morphine, cocaine, cannabis into your product and marketed for whatever you claimed it cured, you had to list that on the label. So you couldn't be deceptive about having something on the label and not have it there. So what was the law used for? You think I'm gonna tell you that it was used to stop some great outrage of drugs. You know, there had been, as a matter of fact, a, a, a drug that had killed 107 people, most of them children, because it included an, a, a sort of an antifreeze product that were used in brake uh, batteries. And uh, you would think it would be used against something like that. No. The first major case that Harvey Washington Wiley brought under the Food and Drug Act was against Coca-Cola. Why? Because he said, and the government said, it's not truth in labeling. You, Coca-Cola, don't, you're called Coca, but you don't have anything from the Coca plant in your product. They had taken that out decades earlier. And you have caffeine in Coca-Cola. You don't list that on the label. So it's, it's, it's misbranding. It's incorrect marketing. They brought the, the, the suit. They lost it. So it wasn't successful. What changes the American drug industry is not that law, but two other laws. The Harrison Act passed in 1914 suddenly makes all narcotics illegal overnight. So the government decides, by the way, we have growing problems with addiction and abuse and diversion. We've got to stop it. Harrison Act stops all narcotics. So right away, 
these drugs, which have been dependent themselves on things like morphine, heroin, opium, um, laudanum, all of these different items, cocaine and cannabis, they can't use it anymore. Then a couple of years later, they go into that great experiment that failed on prohibition in which alcohol is banned and they've lost the basis for most of their drugs. So you literally have an industry that started with addictive drugs in an anything goes environment. And then all of a sudden it had to go cold turkey. You know, you talk about addicts having to go cold turkey, the drug industry did. It was looking for its next product. And to show you how th what we think today is this mammoth trillion dollar industry that's become so powerful, was really lost is the fact that it didn't have any products to put out for the most part. It was looking for products. And it, when Moody's, Moody's is uh, this American institution that ranks uh, companies by size. It comes in, it started in 1909, and it tells you the size of industries. It tells you which ones are the largest, steel industry, auto industry, uh, telecommunications, technology, pharma. When, when Moody's started ranking American industries in 1909, the pharmaceutical industry was so small, it wasn't even listed as a separate category. It was a subset of the American chemical industry. It wasn't even listed as a separate category until nearly 1930, which goes to show you how the industry that we think of as so large today wasn't even on the radar in terms of really being a, a real business. There was insulin discovered in 1922 in Canada, a major breakthrough in terms of people who had uncontrolled sugar problems. And Eli Lilly locked up the distribution rights for that, but that was the big drug discovery. Otherwise, there was nothing that was new. There was even very little understanding about what caused illness, what caused diseases. In 1938, for the first time, this, uh, this Humphrey Dumfries Act that Congress passes a, a, a regulation that says, by the way, for prescriptions that come forward, when we do have them in the future and for drugs that exist now, you're gonna need prescriptions. For the first time, the American Medical Association and doctors have inserted themselves into the process so that instead of the anything goes attitude of the past, in the future, when drugs are approved for this fledging new Food and Drug Administration, although we're not quite sure what they will be yet, when they are approved, drug companies won't be able to sell directly to you, the consumer. There'll be this circuitous route. They'll have to go through doctors who will have to write prescriptions and they will be the ones who judge whether the prescription's right or not. And then what revolutionizes the business? What we know is the modern pharmaceutical industry really came about in World War II with the advent of penicillin. Now, there's no doubt penicillin, who these English uh, researchers at Oxford were working on, had been an accidental discovery by this Scottish um, uh, sort of pharmacologist in, in 1928 in his laboratory, and then sat on the side. Nobody really knew what to do with penicillin. These group of Oxford researchers picked it up and thought it was important in the late 1930s. It is one of the most important discoveries ever because not only does it end up saving hundreds of thousands of lives in World War II on the battlefield from infections, but it saves ordinary lives. People who you know, cut themselves from pruning a rose, rose bush, something as simple as that, uh, and would later get an infection and it would lead to blood poisoning and they could die from it. Infections of all different types that caused deaths beforehand. Really, it was one of the wonder drugs, but nobody realized it until these Oxford researchers came over to the US and said, by the way, we have this drug that we think will be important. And the US government said, oh, okay, middle of World War II, why don't we do a crash effort on this? And you know, you might think about COVID when you think about what's happened with vaccines, and we'll talk about that later. But in World War II, when it came to penicillin, US government made it the secret second project uh, in terms of government funding during the war. The number one secret project was the Manhattan Project for the atomic weapon. The second secret project was the penicillin project. And the government took 15 pharmaceutical firms that volunteered for this. They paid them and put tens of millions of dollars of government effort into it. They built the large manufacturing plants that were necessary to produce in fermentation plants the penicillin that would be produced. And they literally transformed the drug industry so that by the end of the war, these companies were producing massive amounts of penicillin. Very important point to note, as opposed to COVID, where the government has given billions of dollars and so have European governments, billions of dollars to drug companies without any ownership over those rights. They, they've allowed the drug companies to own the rights of what they develop. With penicillin, the government said, we're going to develop this. We're going to give you the money. We're going to build the plants. You're going to make the drug, but nobody owns the rights to penicillin. It's a general drug. There's no patent on it. Everybody can sell it. And as a result, the price of penicillin dropped to pennies a dose 
after the war, there was tremendous competition for it. What happened though is very interesting. What transformed the business are a couple of things. First, at the start of the war in 1939, 1940, if you take a snapshot of the drug industry worldwide, German pharmaceutical companies were the early ones, Bayer, the others, Hesch and others. They were at the forefront, IG Farben. One out of every two prescriptions written in the world in at the start of World War II came from a German pharmaceutical company. Remarkable, half of all the world's drugs. At the end of World War II in 1946, and that continued from that point on, the American pharmaceutical companies, the 15 that emerged from the penicillin project, controlled 80% of the world's prescriptions and 90% of the world's profits. The German companies had been decimated in the bombings at the end of World War II, so they were temporarily outside of the business. The American government had seized many of the German companies here inside the US, the same had happened in Europe. So the German pharmaceutical company was pushed far in the background. The American companies who were made strong on penicillin came to the forefront. And what happened in the 50s becomes what becomes what I call the template for American drug companies going forward for what we know them for the last 70 years. And that is this, penicillin, nobody owned the rights to. So they weren't able to make money off of it. So how do drug companies decide they're gonna make money? Okay, we, meaning drug companies, we each have to discover our own antibiotic. We have to come up with antibiotics different than penicillin, similar, but a little bit different. Penicillin is called a narrow spectrum. So they were looking for broad spectrum antibiotics, things like streptomycin and others that might be able to attack even more infections. And there was a race, as there was with COVID vaccines, to be the first to come to market with these so that you could patent them. In America, you've got the longest patent of any country in the world, that time 17 years. Once you get that patent, you have the rights to exclusively sell that product at a price that you alone determine. And this is critical. We were in the 1950s and we are today in 2021, the only country on the planet that allows drug companies unfettered pricing power. We allow them to set whatever price they want. If the price is too high and nobody will buy it, fine, that's the market condition. But in every other country, there's some medical panel, there's a group of doctors, there's a government agency that tries to negotiate the price, not in the US. So it's always been the wild west when it comes to setting prices, unbridled capitalism, and at the same time, the longest patent and exclusive period. What it led to, companies were searching for antibiotics in soil, because if you go through soil, you sift through tons of soil, you'll find under a microscope that there will be some activity that shows a little bit of what looks like antibiotic activity. There are natural antibiotics in soil. So there was a question that you had to come over. Was it possible to patent a product of nature? If you found something that was in nature, could you go ahead and patent? And the law had always said you couldn't patent a product of nature. It belonged to nature. As a matter of fact, this was the period in the 50s when the polio vaccine was first being developed. And Jonas Salk, who was the American developer of the polio vaccine, uh, when asked by uh, Edward R. Murrow, a radio newsman famous at the day, who owns this vaccine? Do you, you own the rights? Does a drug company own the rights? He, had, he gave an answer that is one of the chapter titles of my book. It's called, Could You Patent the Sun? His point was, no, nobody owns the rights. This belongs to everybody. Uh, you can't patent something that's dealing with public health. So the rule was you couldn't patent something that came from nature, except the drug companies fought this. They went up on appeal. They went before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled in a major ruling in the 1950s that if you found the item that existed in nature and you then process it through a lab, you process it so that it became a therapeutic product that you could distribute as a drug, you could own the patent rights to it. And that was a game changer for the drug industry. So now you had drug companies who were patenting their own antibiotics. And in addition, you had something what I call me too drugs. So some companies were looking for an antibiotic, but they weren't very good at finding it. So another company had spent two or three years developing their own. And then a drug company would take the competitor's antibiotic and change it a little bit uh, by, by sort of, you know, working inside the lab to move its chemical structure a bit. It was chemically very close to the competitor's drug. But once the FDA approved that as being a real drug, it opened the door to what I call so-called Me Too drugs. And we see those over decades in every field, whether it's mild tranquilizers, whether it's hormone replacement, um, whether it's drugs for, uh, for heart uh, pressure and hypertension, 
you'll find Me Too drugs become some of the most successful drugs. They're knockoffs of the first drugs of their type. No better example of a Me Too drug than one put out by Pfizer in the late 1950s. Uh, the, there was a successful drug called Aramycin. It was a broad spectrum antibiotic and was marketed by a small company called Letterlay. Pfizer wanted its own antibiotic. So it took Letterlay's drug, Aramycin, and it manipulated it so that it was missing one oxygen atom, one atom, that's all. That made no difference whatsoever on the efficacy of that drug. It made no difference on how the drug was administered. But Pfizer was still able to go ahead and get a patent for its drug, teramycin. Now, you would think that Pfizer would have some trouble selling teramycin since it had no reason to say it was a better drug. But something happened with Pfizer's drug, teramycin, that also changed the modern drug industry. And that was the marketing of it. The person who came to Pfizer and said, by the way, I can make your drug, your Me Too drug, the number one selling antibiotic in America, was a guy called Arthur Sackler. Now, some of you may have heard that last name Sackler, and you're right if you have heard it, they are the family most often known for owning Purdue Pharma, which is the, the maker of the, the hit blockbuster opioid painkiller OxyContin that's the poster child at the center of the opioid uh, uh, epidemic that's the most lethal prescription drug crisis in American history, and we'll talk about that after. But Arthur Sackler was the oldest of three brothers. Uh, they were the first generation of immigrant parents who arrived and were running a convenience store in Brooklyn. They all became psychiatrists. They all became medical doctors. Um, Arthur Sackler had graduated from NYU School of Medicine. His two brothers tried to get into NYU School of Medicine, but there were quotas for Jewish students at that time. So Jews were only allowed a certain number of seats as were African-Americans and as were, so they had to go to Glasgow, Scotland to finish their medical careers. But Arthur Sackler was the oldest of the brothers and he had a clever idea in the 1950s. He bought a small firm that specialized in medical advertising called McAdams Agency in New York. And he decided he would revolutionize the way that drugs were marketed and promoted. Now, excuse me, you have to realize that drugs weren't marketed and promoted the way they are today. It's not the way that they're sold directly to us. You turn on the television, you see them. This was an antiquated business in the sense that since they had to convince doctors to write prescriptions, the company spent very little on marketing and promotion. They essentially made copies of the inserts of their drugs, um, those long little pamphlets that you'll end up getting with a drug, and they ran those as almost photocopies inside one-page ads or quarter-page ads in medical journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association. That was the extent of advertising, nothing else. Sackler came into Pfizer. And he said to Jack McKean, who was the hard charging chairman of Pfizer, give me $10 million and see what I can do with teramycin. And, and the rest of the industry laughed at Sackler because they thought his ideas were, were brazen crazy. How could you apply Madison Avenue hard sell to drugs? You were selling to doctors. But McKean took a gamble on him and put all that money up. And here's what, here's what Sackler did. And a lot of it will sound familiar to you because they're things that then became uh, the, the standard operating procedure procedure for drug companies uh, in this country and around the world. He developed what's called detail, at the time detail men, they were all men, but today they're called detail teams. They are the sales teams that go out from drug companies and visit doctors personally. They concentrate on the highest prescribing doctors. They try to convince doctors to write the prescriptions. They make the sales in person. And that increased the sales of teramycin by multiple fold. In addition, he was the one who came up with the idea of a so-called speakers bureau. Let's take some doctors and pay them a certain amount of money so that they will go out and speak to other doctors about our product. Let's do conferences. Let's say it's February, it's the middle of winter in New York and it's cold and snowy. We'll have a, a conference in Bermuda where it's nice and sunny and we'll fly all the doctors from New York and Connecticut and New Jersey down to Bermuda so they're able to talk about our product and encourage them to write prescriptions when they get back. Let's do four, uh, four uh, color ads, full page, multi ads inside of medical journals so they stand out. Let's spend the money on posters. Let's spend the money on promotional, what he called pharmaceutical swag, gifts that we give away, that we can give to doctors and we can write. Let's even run ads inside things like National Geographic and Time Magazine that perforated edges along the edges that can be pulled out. And even though we aren't supposed to advertise to consumers, we can send those magazines free to doctors. Now, all of that would have been a big so what 
if it hadn't been for the fact that it worked. Teramycin became the number one selling antibiotic in America, and the rest of the drug company started to follow what Arthur Sackler did. In 1962, Sackler was called before the Senate. As a matter of fact, uh, S.D. Scofalfer, the crusading Tennessee senator who had investigated the mafia, was investigating the drug industry and was thinking that the patent period they had was too long. Maybe it should be more like some European countries and brought down to five years. In addition, he was looking at misleading advertisements, and Arthur Sackler was called before that group. Um, Sackler, his business partners, uh, one Wolfgang Froelich, uh, who I write about in the book, Bill Froelich, who he had secret ownerships with. Behind me, you'll see some writing on the wall. That's me trying to find the list of secret companies of the Sacklers and Froelich and um, a Spanish psychiatrist, Dr. Ibanez, were running at the time. They had the head of the FDA's antibiotic division, the most important person in the regulation of the federal government's drug programs at the time, working for them on the side, editing journals that they produced that did only good reviews slanted reviews about the drugs that their clients had. And then they paid this man at the time a couple of hundred thousand dollars under the table, which was a fortune. When it all came public, it was a big scandal. He had to resign. They're called before the Senate. None of them show up except for Sackler, who dodges every question he's given. And the investigators looking into the whole part about advertising in Sackler, I came up with a freedom of information request that disclosed a, a file that had never been disclosed before that said there's a Sackler empire. And it talked about the extent to which they're involved at every stage of testing, how they had conflicts of interest, how they were promoting drugs that they secretly had an interest in, how they were advertising them at the same time through companies. And yet they emerged from those investigations unscathed. And, and what happens? Arthur Sackler goes on in 1960, not to shame, but he goes on to be picked by Hoffman LaRoche who has a new product that they've turned out in a laboratory. Uh, it's, it's called Librium uh, for equilibrium. It's the first of a new class of drugs called benzodiazepines. And it's really Arthur Sackler who takes that drug, not only makes it the number one selling drug in America by 1963, but he understands something very interesting. He understands the hard sell to doctors. He tells Hoffman and Roche in emails that we now have and in documents that we know, that doctors are unable to concentrate on every new drug coming out. There are 4,000 drugs in the market at this time. Today, there are 20,000 drugs. There are too many drugs, even if doctors specialize, to be able to do all the background research and follow all of the studies. So as a result, the detailed teams that go off are more important than ever. The advertisements that take place are more important than ever. The marketing of the drug becomes more important. And what Sackler does with Librium is he markets it almost as what he calls a lifestyle drug a drug that's the equivalent of a be happy pill. You can go ahead and take Librium, even if you don't really need it for a lot of different situations because it will make you feel better about the way you approach life. And you know, this is an interesting time because in 1960, there was the first lifestyle drug, if you wanna consider that approved by the FDA. It's, it's a serial drug. Uh, it's, an, it's the oral, anti, uh, oral uh, contraceptive, the, the birth control pill. The first time in Equinol, it's called, that a drug has ever been approved by the FDA. It was very controversial, not just for religious objections. The first time a drug had ever been approved for, for a choice. Women didn't have to be sick to take it. They didn't have to have a disease. They didn't have to want to cure something. They had to take the drug because they wanted to have control reproductive rights of when they wanted children. So that drug was approved in 1960 for Sackler and the people who were marketing drugs. That was a watershed moment because they said, ah, now we can have drugs that really are lifestyle drugs. You don't have to necessarily be sick to take them. So Librium was one of those drugs that he tried to use for that purpose. And in Sackler's view, he, he relied on experiments that the US Army had done at Walter Reed Hospital in, in the 1950s. They're called the executive monkey experiments. And I write about this in the book. The army had taken two monkeys and they did a series of experiments in which they strapped them into a contraption to these machines. Their heads are locked back. They can't move any part of their body except for their arms. And they, the army attaches these electrodes to the bottom of the feet of, of the pair of monkeys and they deliver electric zaps to them, sort of these shocks. Then they put next to one of the monkeys a lever. The, if that monkey learns to operate the lever, it stops the shocks to both of them. Now, monkeys are pretty sharp. They learn very quickly. That monkey learns quite quickly. If it operates the, the lever, it's gonna stop the shock for not only that monkey, but for the monkey next door. It does that repeatedly. 
When those monkeys die, and the army repeats this experiment dozens and dozens of times, they did autopsies of the monkeys. The monkey that operated the lever, what the army called the so-called executive monkey, because it had to make the decisions to operate the lever, had ulcers, had problems of, uh, of liver dysfunction, liver early onset liver disease, had arteriosclerosis, had hardening of the arteries, all types of the illnesses you would see from stress and the management of that stress. The other monkey, the non-executive monkey, didn't have the ulcers and didn't have the arteriosclerosis and those same types of items. Time and time again, the autopsy showed the same. So Arthur Sackler and the medical marketeers in America decided, okay, this is how we're gonna sell benzodiazepines and mild tranquilizers. This is how we'll differentiate between men and women. In this very sexist advertisement world, we will say to doctors, and 95% of all doctors in America at the time were men, so this is an easier pitch. We're gonna say, if you're a man, you need to take Librium because you're under the great stress of earning the salary. You're the breadwinner for the household. You need to show the world you're tough. You can never show any weakness. You have to go off every day and you're under all of that pressure. And therefore, Librium will make you a more effective worker and keep you from getting an ulcer. And then to women, we'll sell it to them because they're basically neurotic and hysterical. That's literally the marketing. There are advertisements later that are shocking in how they show and portray women and it will keep you calmer and that's a better way to be. Now, it worked with Librium, but where does it really work on steroids, this marketing? With the next drug from Hoffman LaRoche that Arthur Sackler makes into the most successful drug in drug history at the time, a drug called Valium, which many of you may remember. It's from the same company that had Librium. They put it out three years later. It knocks Librium off the top charts, and Arthur Sackler is able to make Valium the number one drug in America for 15 years. It becomes the biggest selling drug by far. And at a time when it, he manages to do two things. Really, if you think of the mild tranquilizers, they're developed and you think they should be uh, prescribed probably by psychiatrists. And, and he knew, and Sackler said to Hoffman LaRoche, if you have psychiatrists, which I am one, prescribe Valium and Librium, you won't get many prescriptions because there aren't enough of them. So you need to have general practitioners the doctors that people go to see for their general health just prescribing these like candy. And that's exactly what happened. Only 10% of the prescriptions over the 1960s written for Valium came from shrinks, 90% from general practitioners. And nearly two thirds of those prescriptions ended up not only targeting women, but they were for women. They were prescribed by doctors for women. They were ads that were run full page ads in medical journals that literally ended up showing for instance, uh, there's a woman in which Arthur Sackler makes up a fictional 35-year-old woman, and she's shown in pictures over time, first with her father, and then she's shown with dating men. She's unable to find a happy man to marry, and at 35, she's a spinster, and she's alone, and she's neurotic, and what does she need to be better? Valium. There are ads that are run for Adderall at the time. Diet pills were very big in the 60s. Diet clinics opened up. It was the epidemic of the 60s in many ways, the same way that opioids later became the epidemic of the 90s and 2000s, amphetamines and diet clinicians and diet clinics, more than 10,000 diet clinics opened up in the United States, amphetamines being dispensed by doctors at a dizzying rate. And, and the advertisements for those in medical journals showed women vacuuming faster inside the house, doing housework faster, so that it would make you better at what you should be doing inside the house if you were cleaning the house. It's remarkable when we look at them through the prism of just sexist ads. And two things are happening, by the way, when Sackler and the drug industry are promoting these drugs and making them the biggest selling drugs. I mentioned before the birth control pill, the yes, it was revolutionary in terms of giving women the, the, the choice over reproductive rights. But Cyril was receiving reports inside the company from about 1965 and on that there were an increasing number of what looked like blood clots for women taking the uh, birth control pill, their particular model. And there were also women that looked like they were developing uterine cancer. What does Cyril do with those? You think they called up the FDA, called up a local reporter? No. They put them in the back room. They hid those reports. It wasn't until the mid 1970s that it came out by a time when hundreds of thousands of women had already had those adverse effects and some of them had died that that became known. That's one of the first major cases of what I call 
drug company putting out a successful product, learning about the bad results after it's out, and then hiding those results, something that would happen time and time again. Another drug that was out during the period, my wife wrote a book about this called This Is Not Your Mother's Menopause, about her passing through menopause without using hormone replacement because she has a history of breast cancer inside her family. Well, guess what? The original hormone replacement therapy that came out in the early 1960s from Wyeth, uh, Prempro, uh, pregnant you know, mare's urine is the basis for that, uh, became a wildly successful drug. Why? There's a gynecologist in New York called Robert Wilson. Robert Wilson wrote a book called Feminine Forever, in which he says that his own mother, when she went through menopause, became the equivalent of a, 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 a eunuch. They, uh, she had no sexual desire. Her hair thinned, her skin shriveled up. She looked old, she lost her sexuality. And what replaced all of that? Hormone replacement therapy. Now, guess what? It turns out that Robert Wilson's book became a national bestseller, led a lot of women to decide that they actually wanted to use HRT. The book was underwritten by Wyeth, which we didn't know for decades later. His office in New York was underwritten by Wyeth. His own wife, as I disclosed in the book, came down with estrogen-based breast cancer twice. They didn't tell him their own son about it because they thought it would be bad for marketing of the drug. It was only in the 1970s when Wyeth admitted they also had been receiving nearly a, a decade of reports of women developing uterine cancer, blood clots, and breast cancer from extremely high levels of the original levels of hormone replacement and had to then go ahead and reformulate it. And there's something that happens in this period the federal government sets a schedule that, a pattern that unfortunately becomes the way forward. And that is, what's the penalty for these companies? You've gone ahead and you've hidden the, the adverse effects that come in that can be life-threatening about your drugs. You haven't said anything, you've continued to sell them, you've made all this money, now you're caught red-handed. There are Senate investigations. You have no shame because you're worried about making the profits first. So what do you think they do? They charge some of these executives with crimes, with manslaughter. They send them to jail. No, no criminal charges. They find them. They come to these big companies and they say, okay, you did the wrong thing. You may have even killed people. Now we're going to give you a big fine. And the companies pay it. And guess what? It becomes the cost of doing business. That's exactly, they've made billions of dollars on the drugs. They've hidden the idea that benzodiazepines and, and Valium were addictive. Uh, people uh, combining Valium together with liquor and other drugs could die because it reduces, slows your heart rate up. The, and when they finally get caught, they have to pay the amount. Vioxx, many of you may remember, one of the most successful drugs, anti-inflammatories for treating arthritis. Guess what? As those reports filtered into Pfizer that was causing heart attacks and they hid them, when that eventually became public, they do a massive recall. What happens? They pay a fine. So we read about these three, four, five billion dollar fines. And, and in the end, they don't hurt anything but the bottom line a little bit. Now, I want to talk a little bit here about a, the, the biggest prescription, lethal prescription drug epidemic we know about, uh, opioids. And, and it's probably 25, 30% of my book turns out to be about that because it's the uh, product that we know today that has caused so much havoc. Many of you may not know that the origin for this really goes back to the 1960s when, when a nurse turned physician in England, Cicely Saunders, I write about her, she's a fascinating woman, wanted to found the, the modern hospice movement. She had the idea that people who were dying of terminal cancer should not have to die in hospitals. They should have the right to die at home. And she talked to other English doctors about this when she was a nurse because she saw the suffering that went on in hospitals. And they said to her, oh, no one will listen to you. You're just a nurse. You got to be a doctor for us in the British establishment to listen to you. And so she said, okay. She went to medical school and became a doctor. It's a great story. And when she became a doctor, she said, okay, here's the problem. We know people are dying of these end stage cancer. There's nothing we can do about treatment in many of these cases, but they have to stay in the hospital because of the pain treatment. We're giving them the equivalent of, of modern day, you know, heroin or morphine, but it has to be distributed every four hours and usually through an IV. So her holy grail was to find a long acting opioid painkiller that could be given to end of life terminal cancer patients. And if it could be given every eight to 12 hours by a pill form, they could be sent home with their families. She opens the first hospice in 1966 in London called St. Christopher's. Now, 
companies are looking in London and in the UK and in other places to try to find that long acting opioid painkiller. And guess what? One finally finds it. It's, it's called Knapp Pharmaceuticals. And guess who owns Knapp Pharmaceuticals in the UK? The Sackler family. It's their British subsidiary of Purdue Pharma. They come up with a drug called MS Continuous, which is a drug that delivers morphine in an invisible polymer wrapped coating that lets you give it every 12 hours. And that's the basis for hospice to really take off. And at that point, patients start to be able to go home and that drug is used for end of life care for those terminal cancer patients. It's marketed in the US eventually by Purdue as MS Contin. It's the long acting morphine product and it is an end of life terminal cancer pain. Now, Purdue in 1996 gets OxyContin approved. OxyContin is quite different. It's not really different. It's basically the same as the long acting morphine, except what we now know is the company had done a couple of things. It had decided not to use morphine as the base, as the base drug because they knew morphine had a bad reputation. It sounded like it was end of life. Too many doctors said, oh, morphine, that's terrible. So they decided to use oxycodone, chemically very, very similar to, to heroin. So that would become the product inside. They would wrap it in the same polymer invisible coating that would give it up to 12 hours relief. Some studies showed it only gave eight, but they got approved by the FDA for 12. They got the FDA to say something remarkable on the label, although there was no evidence and no studies to, to prove that it was the case. Because it was distributed every 12 hours, only twice a day, Purdue said, by the way, we think that that means you're less likely to be addicted to it. You're not using it every four hours. Therefore, it shouldn't be as subject to uh, uh, addiction. And there had been a small letter published in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years earlier that said there was a very low risk of addiction. Of course, that was a letter. It wasn't peer reviewed. Nobody had studied it. It was actually based upon tens of thousands of hospital admissions in which people had used painkillers for five to seven days and only four had developed an addiction within that week. It wasn't a long-term study, but Purdue cited that. And the FDA said, all right, we think that's right. And they put on the label the fact that they thought it was less likely to be addictive, which is a remarkable thing, which convinced doctors when the sales team went out that it must not really be that addictive at all. And Purdue used that like a hammer. By the way, you should note and talk about this inside the book that the person who approved the, uh, uh, the drug uh, OxyContin at the FDA, uh, Dr. Wright, Curtis Wright, and his assistant who helped approve it, they both went to work for Guess who? Purdue. You're right. They left the FDA for big money over at Purdue. That happens all the time at the FDA. It's one of the big problems uh, you're regulating a drug and then you go to work for the very drug company that you're regulating. So Purdue puts it out and then the problem becomes the sales teams because the sales teams go out and they say to doctors, hey, this is pretty good. This is available for just about everything that you want it to be available for. It's good for backache, not just good for end of life terminal cancer pain. It could be good for osteoarthritis, even though the studies had shown it wasn't good for osteoarthritis. Millions of people have that. It's good for all types of different pain that you could give it for. Now, they were so effective at lobbying and with a group of doctors who were trying to reevaluate opioids, they actually were able to make pain, the treatment of pain, the fifth vital sign. What I mean by that is, you know, you go to a doctor today and doctors ask you about blood pressure, pulse rate, temperature, your breathing rate. Those are the four things they always used to ask you about. Then. Purdue and all the advocates for heavy opioid use said they should ask you about pain as well, because they should say, what's your level of pain today on a scale of one to 10? And if your pain was high enough, even if you didn't have any underlying condition, the doctor couldn't explain it, maybe they'd want to prescribe some OxyContin to you. So over time, doctors came back and they said, by the way, we, we don't think OxyContin is lasting 12 hours. We have uh, some of our patients are coming back and say that it's only every eight hours that they, they have to reuse it. Purdue had a great answer. They said, oh, you know what? Yeah, we, we, your problem is you're not prescribing high enough dosage. You're probably only giving 20 milligrams. You give 40 milligrams, which was a much more profitable pill. They had 60, 80, and for a while, 160 milligram pill, enough to sort of kill an elephant almost. They, and so go to a higher prescription, up the dosage. They had a thing called individualized the dose. They started a program. Individualized the dose was really a way to increase the dosage as well. So it, when doctors came back and said, by the way, you know, you tell us that uh, we think that this is a, uh, not an addictive product, but we see a number of our patients behaving with looks like addictive behavior. Purdue had a great answer. They had a, a, a doctor 
who had given them a proposal for something called pseudo addiction. Now you couldn't make this up because it's such a crazy idea, but what it essentially said is the salespeople went off and told the doctors, look, you've got patients who seem to be addicts. They are clamoring for more and more of the drug. They want it all the time. They're willing to steal money to try to get it. They, they could be buying it on the black market where it's been diverted to. Uh, and you know the problem is? Because they aren't really addicted. It's a pseudo addiction. They need more of the drug. You need to up the dosage again. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but believe it or not, doctors did that. In, in 2010, jumping up a little bit here, but in 2010, when a patent was running out on, on its early version of OxyContin, Purdue rewrapped it in a, a slightly sem different chemical structure and came up with something called a tamper resistant version. That sounds fantastic because now you think nobody's gonna be able to abuse it, snort it, whatever else. It wasn't tamper resistant. They marketed it as tamper resistant and doctors believed it was. And so it increased sales again, but it wasn't. And the thing that is most upsetting here is that some of you who are listening will have had friends who have become victims of opioids, have misused them, became addicted to opioids. You know, I have a chapter in, in my book called You Messed With the Wrong Mother. It's about Marianne uh, Skolik, uh, who lost her daughter, Jill, in 2002. And she becomes, her form of grief is to become a one-person warrior to go after Purdue. And at one point, they try to smear her. And she says to one of the Purdue people, you messed with the wrong mother. And it's really true. Since I published my book, I've met a number of parents, literally several dozen, um, who are in similar situations and also became real fighters. Ed Bish lost his son, Eddie Jr., and he's still at the forefront of fighting. Dan Schneider uh, lost his son. Some of you may have seen him in HBO's The Pharmacist. Um, uh, Cynthia Munger, uh, Barbara, so many of them that I have talked to who have lost children, who have turned their grief into fighting Purdue. And most of them, who lost their children in the early 2000s were there when in 2007, the federal government charged Purdue, which was owned by the Sackler family, privately owned, with misbranding the drug felonies and brought all types of charges. The company pleaded guilty and guess what they did? It's what I talked about before. They paid a big fine over $600 million. They agreed that they had done all this improper marketing and misbranding and these were felonies. Three of the top executives, no one in the Sackler family, pleaded guilty. They had to pay big fines. They were out of the pharmaceutical industry. So in 2007, you think it's over. The government caught them, fined them. That's it, all the bad behavior. And that's the part where this story is so terrible is that from 2008 until the current day is when Purdue Pharma and OxyContin had its biggest sales. From 2008 on, they violated every part of the consent agreement that they had fined, and nobody came in and paid attention to what was going on with that fraud. From 2008 and on is when the company sold most of the $35 billion in gross sales that the drug pulled in. In 2015, the Sackler family made Forbes' richest families list with an estimated net worth of $14 billion. At the time, Forbes called them the Oxy Clan. And I will tell you, this isn't a family like the family of Johnson & Johnson or Squibb or Lilly, which started a company that became a multinational company with hundreds of product lines. This is a one hit wonder company. And what I mean by that is, you know, you hear record uh, of bands in the 60s or 70s, they had one hit, one hit wonders. That was the end of them. They had a hit, we all heard it on the pop charts, we thought it was great, then we never heard from them again. Well, it turns out that's almost what OxyContin is for Purdue. It's the one hit, becomes a massive bestseller, $35 billion in sales, almost all the profits taken out by the family, they become billionaires, $14 billion. Now, as this rages on, people are dying across the country. There's an epidemic that the press continues to talk about. What does Purdue Pharma do at the end of 2019? Purdue Pharma, the company that puts the drug out, says, oh, sorry, we're bankrupt. They file bankruptcy in New York. They sort of shop around for the best judge they can find this judge in White Plains, New York, that they think is favorable in handing these big case bankruptcy, bankruptcies, Judge Drain. They file their case there. And what does the Sackler family do? The Sackler family comes before the court and they say, by the way, we ran 
uh, those of us who ran, we were the seven to eight directors. We ran the company for all these years. Uh, the, we were the directors who directed how things were done. We were the people who took the money out of the company. We aren't bankrupt, but we want to be part of this bankruptcy in this sense. We would like to eventually reach a global settlement for the thousands of lawsuits and all the actions by the federal government and the state's attorneys general to settle all of these in this bankruptcy court. So maybe we can contribute some money to this. And as a result, we can walk out of this court scot-free with no liability, no civil liability and no criminal liability as well. Well, there's precedent for this in the drug industry, of course, in the pharmaceutical industry. And that's the Robbins case in which they had had a trouble before with an IUD that turned out to be very problematic. And when that IUD became the cause of all types of lawsuits, the company, A.H. Robbins, declared bankruptcy. This goes back 20 years ago. And the Robbins family, which owned it, went before the court and they were able to contribute to the final settlement. And they walked away from that uh, process without having any further liability. The court allowed that to happen. And the very same thing happened here with the Sacklers or is pending right now as I talk to you. And that's why this is so critically important. The Sacklers originally offered $3 billion to the settlement. Now they've upped it to $4.5 billion. That sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I don't mean to sneeze at $4.5 billion, but I guess if you have an 11 to $14 billion fortune, it's not that much. You walk away still with billions of dollars in OxyContin profits. The judge is going to decide this summer whether to accept that or not. And right now, Congress has put in, in the House of Representatives, a bill called the Sackler Act, actually named after them, that would stop individual parties like the Sacklers or the Robbins family, who have not declared bankruptcy, from walking away with full liability discharges just by contributing money. And so I'm a big proponent of the Sackler Act being passed, and I hope that the Senate does something about it, and I hope it does get passed. You should write your senators and you should write your congresspeople saying, please pass the Sackler Act, it's something you can do. Now, I'm gonna switch just for a second, wrapping up, because I wanna leave a lot of time for questions. Opioids are part of what this book talks about, but I want you to know that I also talk about things that some of you may be familiar with and some may have never heard about. I have a chapter on something called orphan drugs. You say, or, you know, orphan what? Orphan drugs are the most expensive drugs in the world. If you take the top 10 most expensive drugs in the world today, nine of them are orphan drugs. And it was actually started in the early 1980s. Just to give you the quick overview. US government passed a law that said to drug companies, by the way, there are these rare genetic diseases. Some of them accept, affect only a few hundred people. So drug companies weren't spending any time looking at them because there wasn't enough money. The market wasn't big enough. So the, the government gave them incentives. It said, we'll give you an extra seven year easy patent. You'll get through the FDA approval process uh, faster. We'll liberalize the rules. We'll give you tax credits. We'll give you tax incentives, all types of things. And as a result, pharmaceutical companies started to develop these drugs and they marketed them at very high prices. The problem is that the system has been gained repeatedly. Now the drug companies know how to game the system in ways the original law never intended. They get multiple approvals for the same drugs. They get approvals for drugs that later become mass generic popular drugs. And if you read that particular chapter on orphan drugs, you'll realize that it's something that should be corrected tomorrow by the United States Congress, but it's not because both parties, Republicans and Democrats are beholden to the drug industry in too many ways. I have a, another chapter on what's called PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers. They turn out to be unique to the United States. They originally started out in the 1980s also as sort of almost what I call payroll processing companies. So they went out to drug companies just at the time managed care came in and insurance. So now you have insurance starting to grow independent insurance. So people at work would have their own insurance policies and each insurance policy covered something different. You had to apply to see how much of your, your deductible applied and what your levels were. So these companies came out and they said to big corporate America, Fortune 500 companies, you don't want to process all this paperwork with insurance companies for your employees on, on the medical claims. We'll do it. We'll be like payroll processors. So that's all they were. But then they became over time multi-billion dollar companies. I mean, we know them today as CVS's uh, Caremark, as uh, you know, if you think of the size of them, uh, these are companies literally that have uh, United Health's Optimum RX uh, uh, Express scripts. And they've become far more than just payroll processors. These are companies that eventually 
formed the formularies for which drugs would be accepted under your insurance plan. So sometimes you have to look to see if the particular drug you have, if you're on Medicare, for instance, you have a prescription D policy, is your drug covered under the formulary? Guess what? That decision is not made necessarily by the insurance company. It's not made by the pharmaceutical company. It's made by these bureaucrats called pharmacy benefit managers. Even the pharmacist who the retail pharmacist at the end of the line doesn't know how the process takes place except for one thing, rebates. So drug companies will say to the pharmacy benefit managers, by the way, we'll pay your rebate on every prescription written for this particular drug to treat hypertension, not because it's the best of the drugs, not because it's the cheapest of the drugs available, but because it's the drug we're gonna give you a rebate on. And PBMs will put that drug on the formulary. You as a lay person, the consumer think it's on the formulary because it must be the best of the drugs. It's there because the PBM is making millions and millions of dollars from having placed it there. And the key part is they don't have to disclose it to anyone. Under the current law, there's no requirement that makes them disclose publicly in a database the rebates that they get from drug companies. That's a disgrace. The last thing I talk about in the second last chapter, the coming pandemic, and that the first chapter in the book is called Patient Zero. It's about a woman in her 70s who catches a bacterial infection, an intestinal infection that should not be lethal. It's an infection that came from India. She had traveled to India before this. And in a hospital in Reno, Nevada, they start to treat her with antibiotics. It's basically going under the radar. This case it did not get a lot of press. And, and they finally treat her with every known antibiotic approved by the US FDA and available. And none of them worked and she died. She's the first patient to die of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance has grown since the 1950s and 60s when antibiotics were discovered. They were overprescribed. Doctors gave them from uh, sore ears to you know sniffles to everything that you walked into the office for without determining you really had a bacterial infection. As a result, people built up a resistance to them. We've added uh, them to the water supply. We spray crops, as I talk about in Florida, the citrus crops with streptomycin. Uh, we have uh, them being used on regular crops, on plant crops. They are used on cattle and in the food supply. Uh, in tests in England in the 1970s, um, even children who didn't drink milk or were lactose intolerant had levels of antibiotics that they had picked up from just the food supply. So this is a problem across the board. It creates antibiotic resistance. And the fear of physicians is pharmaceutical companies have stopped making new antibiotics. Why? Money because they used to be in the business of making antibiotics and then they decided, hey, why should we make antibiotics? We spend all this money making them, they're only good for five to seven days. You get a short treatment, maybe three days in some cases. And doctors don't use the latest and greatest antibiotic. They use an old one because they want to give the new one to create antibiotic resistance. So they left the field to come up with drugs for chronic diseases, hypertension, migraines, blood pressure, sugar, things like that, where somebody could take a pill every day for the rest of their life, it's much more profitable. As a result, we have fewer antibiotics at a time when antibiotic resistance is growing. And if the pandemic we're now facing, which is viral, was instead bacterial, like the Black Plague had been, if it was a bacteria that was jumping from one species to another and spreading as a bacterial infection, and we needed an antibiotic to fight it, the antibiotics that we had, we were resistant to, we would really be in a race to try to save the planet. So you talk about potential risk that we are at with not being prepared. We're not prepared in part because the pharmaceutical industry has decided not to look into antibiotics because there's not enough money there and they should be encouraged to do so. So I want to you know, sum up in the sense that I've given you this sort of you know, brief background in the history of the business, touched on a few things like opioids and, and uh, you know, uh, orphan drugs and pharmacy benefit managers and the lack of antibiotics and the profits inside the industry. There's a lot to cover. And all I wanna say is I wanna thank you very, very much, not only for coming to listen to me this morning, but having the patience to, to stay through and to listen to this uh, lecture. And hopefully uh, you'll have some questions and I'll have some answers for you as we go along and discuss it. Some of you may be interested in looking at the book eventually, but I will guarantee you that if you do, it will be a resource and reference book that at times will raise your blood pressure because there are some infuriating stories in it when it comes to public health and profit in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you very much for being such an attentive group. Gerald, wow. Uh, somebody just mentioned in, in the chat how you've done all the research for us and boy, have you. And we thank you and we're grateful for that. And um, 
really quite eye-opening. And with that, yes, everyone, if you haven't noticed in the chats, uh, what we'd like to have you do, obviously, many of you must have questions for Gerald. Uh, what we ask is that you go ahead and in your Zoom tools box down in the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click on your reactions tab. And when you click on that reactions tab, a little thing pops up and says, raise hand. If you click raise hand, um, we'll see your hands raised and we'll take your questions in, in the order by which we receive them. And so uh, that said, we're just starting to see some raised hands coming in, I believe. <laughs> Give us just a second here, Gerald. And yeah, ben, and Ben, if I can say one thing. The, sure. You, you said before when you're introducing me, and you're right, I worked on uh, 13 books, uh, 15 with my wife. We've done everything from Nazi war criminals to you know, finance of the Vatican to, to terrorism. This book has me on fire in a way that few other books have, and that's because it affects all of us. You know, it's one thing to write about finances of the Vatican. You know, if you're a banker in Europe, or you're a, a mobster trying to hide money, it might affect you. But in this case, we have an industry that's built around health. We, COVID, we can talk about, we haven't even talked about that. It, the decisions being made affect all of our lives. Even if you don't take a pill, even if you don't take a prescription, pharma is affecting the way that it's marketing to you and direct to consumer ads and the way that people think about drugs and treatments and cures and complementary treatments. So this book has me on fire because I realize the extent to which this trillion dollar a year industry affects our lives, whether we are patients taking prescriptions or not. Um, they have a tremendous amount of influence in the way the government approaches medicine and cures, quote unquote. Uh, well said, yes, thank you for that. And um, I'm just looking at our screen here now for raised hands. Thought I saw one a second ago. Bear with me here for just a moment, Gerald. Sure, no problem. Um, let's see tech team, not sure if I'm missing something with a raised hand, but I'm not seeing it if you can help me out and throw me a bone. There we go. Okay, so our first question is coming in from uh, Sandra. Sandra, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, um, we'll go ahead and, and take your question. If you can keep it brief and direct for Gerald. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm wondering what you think about COVID and what you think about the vaccines. The, yeah, th thanks, Sandra. I, you know, so I said to a reporter in March of 2020, and it was picked up widely in the press, that COVID-19 presents a once in a lifetime business opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry. Now, that's not commenting on the quality yet of the, uh, of the treatments or the vaccines. What it's saying is I'm not saying that they're sitting around a table, they made COVID up and they insert it into China and had it happen. It's not that but they are opportunists as most business people are. So when an opportunity presents itself, they will jump on top of it. And what COVID presented was unique. Here are these companies, multi-billion dollar companies like Pfizer, Johnson, Johnson, others. They have their product lines and they have products in the pipeline for what's coming up for the next six to seven to 10 years. They know what the drugs that they're working on. Now, all of a sudden, this curveball's thrown out of left field and it's a pandemic certified as a pandemic by the World Health Organization. There's nothing better to sell a product or to get funding from the government and good terms than fear. And, the, and fear cre is created in that pandemic. And as a result, you're now talking about a multi-billion dollar revenue stream that they didn't expect to exist in terms of vaccines and treatments for COVID that may continue for years down the road. So the companies jump at that. The mistake that was made was at the government level, both in the United States and in Europe. The, in the penicillin project, the money was given to these companies so long as they shared their research information and nobody owned the patent rights. There was an outfit out of Norway, believe it or not, called the Coalition Against Epidemics and Pandemics formed in 2015 to deal with the next pandemic. Drug companies and European and the US government were members of it. And it had a policy that said, by the way, in the next pandemic, Everybody will share the information. Nobody will own the patent rights to make large profits. Once the pandemic hit with COVID, everybody forgot about that. And the first $3 billion grant given from the US government before stimulus or anything else, right in the beginning, if you go back and check the news accounts, we give $8 billion in this grant from Congress. 3 billion of it goes directly to drug companies to look for a COVID vaccine. Now, in the first draft of the bill, there were two clauses. 
One gave the federal government real power to come in and crack down on those companies if the price they were charging for the vaccines were too high. And the other said, no one owns the rights to the research. You're using taxpayer money. You're going to have to share the research. Both of those clauses were out when the bill was passed a week later. So we had a democratically controlled Congress. We had a Republican president. They all had to agree to it. As I say, both sides of the aisle beholden to pharma. And so pharma gets a $3 billion without any strings attached. That's not unusual, by the way. $900 billion of taxpayer money has been spent since the late 1930s by the National Institute of Health, public money on public research that's often taken then by drug companies. They put a patent on it, they make money on it, nothing comes back to the treasury. So now you have drug companies who are using public money to go ahead and try to find a, a vaccine or a, a, a treatment. And when those eventually come in, there's a second thing they ask for. They say, we want no liability for any injury caused by the vaccine that we've now had to push through at a fairly fast rate. And the basis for that, I have a chapter about called the swine flu fiasco. In 1976, for those of you who may remember, when Gerald Ford was president, there was a scare for a while that swine flu, which is the same basic type of flu that had caused the, the great epidemic of 1918, was coming back. There had been a case of Fort Dix with a soldier. So the Ford administration got four pharmaceutical companies to go ahead and make 100 million doses of the vaccine to go ahead and give and inoculate the entire country. By the time they went to get those vaccines, the four companies said, ho, ho, not so fast. We want two things. We want a guarantee of a reasonable profit, and we want you, the U.S. government, to forgive us for any liability of anything that happens with bad effects. The government agreed. That was the precedent. Ford gave out 40 million of those vaccines before they stopped. There was no swine flu epidemic. And guess what? After they were given out about 5,000 cases of Guillain-Barre, this rare neurological brain disorder, more than what would have formed otherwise were the result of that vaccine, debilitating illness for those who have it and for their family. The government defended all the lawsuits. The government paid all the claims. So today with COVID, the companies knew what they already had from a swine flu, and they said the same thing. You, the governments, have to cover us for any liability, and that's exactly what's happened. Now, the vaccines themselves, and I've studied this, I've stayed on top of this, they will be effective in their studies if you look at them to the extent that I believe they will keep you from ending up on a ventilator in an ICU unit so that a vaccine will prevent you from getting the worst possible aspects of COVID if you are tending toward, if you have other health conditions that may put you at greater risk if you get infected with COVID. But there's not one shot in and out. What I mean by that, one shot in and out is what the, what the pharmaceutical companies call the polio vaccine. You get one shot and for decades, you never have to worry about it again. If that was the case here, you'd never have to turn your back again and worry about COVID. This is more like the influenza vaccine, where they get a vaccine that fits pretty much with what COVID looks now. It doesn't cover every variant that may come out in the future. They're already talking about booster shots. Pfizer is doing a clinical trial right now on booster shots that may be required anywhere from six months to a year after the original shot. That's a steady stream of revenue. So I'm not saying that the vaccines don't work. I think the vaccines can be effective, but I don't think they're a panacea. They don't immediately return us to a pre-COVID normal. And what they will do, I think, is be a steady stream of revenue for the pharmaceutical companies that develop for a long time to come. Gerald, thank you for that. Up next, we have uh, Stephen. Stephen G, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, we'd love to have your question for Gerald. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen. I just wanted to say thank you so much to Real Health or Real Truth for this wonderful conference. It's very powerful. And Gerald, uh, I find your research to be very powerful and very critical. I just wanted to share with you in the audience today that I, uh, I'm participating here today from London, Ontario in Canada. And I'm, I'm literally three or four blocks away from the house where Dr. Frederick Banting discovered insulin uh, in his bed in the middle of the night in a eureka moment. Uh, it's actually a natural, it's a national historical building now, and it's so significant in our country's medical history that the, the country's uh, medical hall of fame is just located down the street. My, my, my question is, Dr. Frederick Banting sold the patent to insulin to the University of Toronto for a dollar 
uh, in trust that the university would um, protect it. I was shocked and horrified to hear Bernie in the election talk about what's happened to insulin in the United States. And I was wondering, Gerald, if you could just comment a little bit about how does this happen? And does a university like U of T, which is publicly funded in Canada, our largest university, but increasingly is subject to the forces of corporatization every day, how is it, uh, does U of T sell the patent to fund important medical research? And then what happens for us to be in this situation like this? Yeah, no, it, Stephen, it's a great question. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's one of the things that's happened is the financial pressure has even formed, not just I think the university there, but you'll see it at Oxford, you'll see it at, at Harvard and Yale and other institutions in which their researchers have been involved in, in getting a patent that is assigned to the school and then become so profitable that everybody's able to justify its use to license it to, to pharmaceutical companies to be able to, to maximize its profit because they say, of course, the money's coming back to fund further research or to help the institution. And that is true. Uh, Dr. Banty, I'm sure, would turn over in his grave if he knew how it had been commercialized. And there are unique aspects of what's happened in the United States in terms of insulin. So that Americans, for the most part, if I stop 10 people down the street and ask them about insulin and said, who do you think invented it? They would say some American somewhere because it's marketed so heavily as this American product. They don't realize it was a Canadian invention. And that's due in large part to Lilly. L Lilly understood how to game the system. What I mean by that is when they got the original distribution rights, that, that extended for that period of the patent, even under American protection for no more than 15 to 17 years, got it in the 1920s. And yet Lilly held that right for more than 40 years exclusively, kept everyone out of the market in the US. How was that possible? It's possible because of the way that the patent system here in the US is also gamed by the pharmaceutical companies they make small adjustments to their product, and that happens from insulin on through OxyContin, in which they can claim some new development to the drug, and it doesn't have to be better therapy. It can be in the way the drug is administered. So if you needed to take insulin uh, twice a day, let's say, beforehand in an injection, if they can bring it to once a day, they have just extended their patent for an entire new time. Uh, and, and Lilly was able to sort of do this for a 40 year period. And then once it, the floodgates opened up and it became a more generic product, why is insulin so expensive today? Because of shortages of the production, synthetic insulins are available for the first time in terms of biotechnology. And I talk about how those come in, they have a separate set of patents that apply to it. And insulin is sort of a classic story. I'm glad you brought it up in terms of how a great discovery of a drug, similar to penicillin with the British, later comes to be manipulated through the American system for profits at the forefront. And one quick sideline, I'm sorry, but just to mention, in penicillin, for instance, the British researchers had discussed whether they should put a patent on it in England before they brought it to America. And they decided, no, that would be terrible. Why should we do that? This should be for the public good. They didn't do it. Once they brought it to America, although there was no patent on the drug, American pharmaceutical companies are clever when it comes to making money. They put through what they call use patents. So they came up with better ways to ferment, better ways to speed up the, the manufacturing process, ways to get larger capacities of drugs with fewer rejections along the line. They would get a patent on that. So a few years after the war ended, the British, who had invented the drug, had given it to us for free, we're paying money to make it because of the American use patents. That was really a touch of adding a salt to the wound. Gerald, thank you. We have our next question from Jess. Jess, if you'd go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, one of the most brilliant lectures I've ever heard. Um, I'm recovering from detrimental side effects from opioids, including oxycodone, steroids, oral and injected, and uh, radiation injected and CT scans. And these were prescribed by Western medicine MDs. And the side effects include exhaustion, brain fog, dizziness, stomach cramps. Three quick questions, if I may. A, is it possible to detox from these uh, pharmaceuticals? B, 
have you ever heard of anyone detoxing from these pharmaceuticals? And C, if so, what do you recommend to detox from these pharmaceuticals in addition to stop taking them? Yeah. Well, Jess, uh, sorry to hear that uh, you have been through a battery of um, some of the uh, the hardest things in uh, in Western medicine, without a doubt. Um, I know I don't know the specifics of what can be used for detoxing, but I do know that there are an assortment of recommendations in, in natural and homeopathic medications to detox from everything from general anesthesia to, as you say, opioids to radiation exposure. And some of the presenters, as a matter of fact, in this conference may have specific information about that. And I wanna say one thing, Jess, you're saying I think is critically important. If you've been through a process as you have been in which you've been subjected to this input of radiation, steroids, and then to uh, uh, the Oxycontin withdrawal, your body's gone through multiple levels of having to adapt to each. And Western medicine, especially the American drug industry, they focus on one issue at a time to the detriment of everything else happening in your body. So if you go to a doctor and you have hypertension, high blood pressure, and they prescribe for you a, a pill to keep that blood pressure under control, they're not taking into effect most of the time any other pill you might be on, what your natural regimen is, vitamins you're taking, supplements, uh, what you're doing in terms of your own exercise in life. And so the side effects from that pill may be one thing in a clinical lab and in a clinical trial. It may be quite different when combined with other things that are going on in your life. And so I think that these things can have a synergistic effect that couple together to really set you back, as you say, in terms of brain fogginess and everything else. And therefore, it really takes a natural path um, or, uh, to be able to, to go over what's happened to you and what else is happening in your current life to say, these are the things I think are best for detoxing. Now, that being said, one last thing. I'm a believer in complementary medicine. So I think Western medicine and pharmaceutical companies and some of the drugs that come out have very important things. If I have an infection, a bacterial infection, if I'm suffering from something that can be treated by uh, medicine, I'm going to have it taken care of. But if I also can find something through uh, complementary medicine, I will work with that as well. And I think that nobody should fool themselves to think that big pharma only competes with itself, meaning that Pfizer only competes with Moderna and Moderna only competes with, with Eli Lilly. They also are competing against alternative ways to be healthy. They're competing against the vitamin and supplement industry. They're competing against naturopaths. They're competing against osteopaths. They're competing against chiropractors in essence, because all of those are potential competition for taking patients away from the need for pills. And so the extent that it takes people away from the need for pills, that becomes, um, I think, um, a, a competitive force against it. And that's where the information, the billions and billions of dollars spent on direct to consumer ads that were approved since 97 have such an effect on the way people think. So I don't have an answer specifically for you, unfortunately, in what could be done for detoxing, but I have little doubt that with a little research or, or checking with people here at this conference that you will find some things to get you back on the road to feeling better. And I, and I hope that happens in very fast order for you. Cheryl, thank you so much. Um, this has been truly remarkable and again, very eye-opening. The comments have shown how much people have been appreciating everything you've done and the way you've communicated it today. Um, or I think it looks like that's it on questions at this point. Um, so with that, I, before we let you go, is there anything else that you wanted to share that we haven't covered? No, all I want to say is to everybody, and I'm sure that I'm speaking to the uh, singing to the choir here, just be informed consumers. Know what you're getting. If you go to a doctor and they prescribe a pill to you, ask them why they are prescribing that pill. Why that specific pill? What is it in terms of the clinical studies that show that it's effective and worthwhile? Not what some drug rep told them. Um, and, and find out, by the way, if you have the courage to ask it. Uh, you can check it online, but it's difficult to find. Find out if that doctor receives any funding from that pharmaceutical company, if they've done studies for that pharmaceutical company, if they've written articles in a clinical uh, a medical journal for that uh, pharmaceutical company about that drug. You don't want to take a drug from somebody who's shilling for it. You don't want to take a drug for somebody who's paid to promote that drug. You want to take a drug if you have to take it for a condition because the doctor is honestly looking at the available information and has made a decision 
that that drug is the best choice for you temporarily for whatever condition you have. So be an aggressive consumer. Remember, they're the physician, they're serving you. You're the consumer and the patient. You get to ask every question you can about your health. And, and one thing I've learned from the pharmaceutical industry, you can't ask too many. Thank you very much.